welcome to GQ India's Food and Drink Festival. I'm Roshni Bajaj Sangvi, a food and travel writer, and I'm joined today by three extraordinary chefs and restauranters. Chef Alex Sanchez of the delightful Italian casual dine Americano in Mumbai, Chef Anumitra Ghosh Tastidar, who joins us from Goa, where she's doing amazing work as a co-founder of Edible Archives, also where I had my last great meal before the lockdown, and Chef Manu Chandra from Bangalore, the ace behind some of her favorite dining establishments and bars, including Toast and Tonic, Monkey Bar, and The Fatty Bow. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you all for being here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a subject that's very close to our hearts, inclusion or the lack of it in the kitchen. So let's get right to it. Um, how inclusive were kitchens when you started your careers? When I first started my career, it was very much in sort of, you know, white male dominated kitchens, primarily, you know, uh, French. Um, but when I came here, it was sort of like I was being adopted into the, the pre-existing system here. Um, and, you know, I took on a team of people that had primary, you know, primarily worked with someone, someone else, uh, and they were kind of used to their own system and, you know, and they didn't really speak English. So, uh, being my first chef job, it was kind of like this crazy adjustment where not only am I adjusting to being a leader and to being, um, and to being a chef, uh, but then also to a new culture and particularly, uh, you know, a, a kitchen culture which was far different than the one that I was brought up in. Um, mm -hmm. And so in terms of, uh, you know, inclusiveness, uh, I would say that I was in, in some ways the odd man out, uh, mm -hmm. but in order to kind of take it by the reins, um, I did what I knew best, what I knew had worked for me previously was just to scream. I mean, okay. there's, no, there's no better <laughs> way to get immediate results than to just scream and cry like a baby. Um, and, you know, I, I think that now we're, we're definitely a far cry from that, but in some ways that old school system, that old school mentality, that militaristic mentality is still very much a part of this industry. What was the culture shock like? Did you feel accepted here easily or did it take you a little while to settle in? It took a long time for me to settle in to, like I said, to the role. Um, but, you know, culturally also the, it was the first mm -hmm. time that I was dealing with um, you know, I was, I was familiar with there being issues of, uh, exclusion when it came to race and perhaps mm -hmm. gender, but it was the first time that I had really, uh, come across, uh, this idea of there being a socioeconomic differences that played a key role in how people interacted with each other in the kitchen. Um, and I think that that was something that I exploited maybe unknowingly, uh, okay. Certainly, certainly not intentionally, but where I felt like there would be no repercussions to my action, to where I could scream and belittle people um, and intimidate people and be aggressive uh, without there being, you know, any risk of a lawsuit or, <laughs> I mean, it was just, you just get the work done however it needs to be done and, you know, utilize the tools that are most readily available, which is your voice and, you know, gestures and, like I said, intimidation and aggression. Um, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's something that I, that I look at now is, I mean, completely unacceptable and, and, and childish, but you have to understand that, you know, when you're, when you're raised in this industry and you're young and you're impressionable, and mm -hmm. then you want to be accepted by the people that you admire. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you see that the one, the one tactic that they use to get results from you is through screaming or you know maybe through physical violence or whatever it is then it it's quite easy to see why you know someone who then becomes a leader is going to use those tools in the same way yeah. um it's just it's just convenient it's easy and it's thoughtless manu what do you what do you feel about how kitchens have sort of changed their perspective of inclusivity over the last say 10 or 15 years um from the time that you started out early in your career to where you are now and how kitchens run differently? Well, yeah, I guess my perspective is uh, over a broader period of time because I started apprenticing in uh, professional Indian kitchens when I was very young, 15, 16, and uh, at five-star hotels, which were honestly, uh, I mean, inclusivity was not really a term that got uh, used very much or thrown around. It may have been outside of the kitchens for PR purposes, but not really 
uh, or the on-ground reality. And it can be quite scarring for a uh, very young and, as Alex said, impressionable mind because it was a toxic work culture. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, besides the socioeconomic differences, the pecking order and the hierarchy uh, afforded a, a very, very unpleasant experience for uh, newer, younger people who are excited to be part of this, uh, you know, so-called uh, uh, a glamorous industry, which it was anything but. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the sexual uh, discrimination that one saw take place in kitchens like that, it was, it was jarring because, uh, you know, one, I came from a fairly privileged background where both my mom and dad worked together in running a business. So the upbringing was very, very different to what you suddenly stepped into. So it was a culture shock. And uh, it kind of made me uh, reassess uh, whether this is what I wanted to get into or not, because it, it was just so bad. Uh, I obviously then went uh, abroad and I worked there for a while, which is very similar to what Alex said, you know, mostly male dominated uh, white kitchens. Also, you know, the fair share of them quite toxic. And then coming back again to India, which was in 2005, yeah, yeah, that, that was 15 years ago. Uh, I think I did try to bring about the change I would want, uh, wanted to have seen in an ideal kitchen. And it wasn't easy. I mean, the rite of passage to get to that point was a very, very difficult one. And there were just so many reasons for it, um, which I, I'm sure we can, uh, you know, dwell, dwell into more uh, when we talk further. But did I see a huge shift or a paradigm shift in, in 10 to 15 years? Not as much as I'd like to see or I hoped for, uh, to some extent, yes, I think awareness, uh, the, the, you know, the rise of social media, a lot of that did contribute to creating somewhat of a level playing field, but like I said, not really as much as one had hoped for. Having said that, I do feel that at some level, there is an embracing of uh, this, this, this toxicity uh, because you know, and, and everyone is guilty of being a perpetrator to that. Uh, you know, your biggest culinary heroes sometimes are the ones who are screaming, shouting on television, uh, you know, hurling abuses at everyone and they have the highest TRPs, everyone's watching it. Has it changed with, uh, with a generation of chefs who have like since retired? Do you feel like the newer, the younger generation is a little bit more measured in the way they sort of look at differences? Roshni, honestly, now, I, I, you know, running a lot of restaurants across the country, uh, one gets to see it from very different prisons every time I move from one city to the other. Uh, at one point, I've always maintained that there is a level of cultural homogeneity that one was bound to experience because of, like I said, the world becoming a smaller place, the smartphone phenomena. Everyone listening to the same music, watching the same television shows, wearing the same clothes, being inspired by the same heroes. Um, so there's one level of that. But the moment you start traveling to different towns and different cities, you do realize that there are stark differences. And whilst all this is happening, there is also the parallel explosion of restaurants that, that took place. Now when suddenly you have an industry which was nascent and, and it becomes this, this mammoth, where is the leadership coming from? Leadership at that, that scale cannot be created overnight. Yet we had this entire restaurant bubble happening. So who becomes the leader? The leader becomes the number two, the number three of a successful kitchen or an understudy who is not even nearly geared to head up a bunch of people and, you know, make them behave the right way, make sure that they have to, you know, behave a certain way with each other and then customers on you know so it's it became a vicious cycle now you've got the number two number three number fours of a place who who suddenly start climbing the ladder and they become the leaders to assume that there would be uh, you know responsible restauranting or running of a kitchen is 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 bizarre it, it just can't happen um anumitra uh, there's I'd like you to talk about your time at Tamura San and how the environment was then and how you felt uh, that it could have been more sort of egalitarian. Um, 
What was it like working at Tamaristan? What was it like working at Diva? What was it like then setting up your own restaurant and how did that inspire the culture that you uh, sort of, that, that Edible Archives occupies? When I joined uh, uh, Tamura and uh, there, uh, I joined because I liked uh, uh, Tamura san, who actually trained me in Japanese cuisine. And uh, uh, when I first joined, there was uh, never a uh, female kitchen staff in that restaurant. The restaurant was running for 27 years, and there was not a single kitchen staff uh, or even front of the house of uh, a woman staff. So there was no place even to change uh, clothes. And then uh, Tamara San said, no, no, you use the customer's toilet for uh, changing. So it started there. I, and um, after that, my experience is very different because then I went to Japan to work for some time, came back and in Delhi, like I started my own place and then I started working with Diva. And uh, there it's little because my boss was Ritu Dalmia. The toxicity in the kitchen was there, but it was not uh, like I didn't have to face all of that. In Tamura, I was facing the class difference was there. and But with that, there was also a gender in, in equality, which was like, so that was creating both of this, creating a kind of a balance. Because in hmm. somewhere they were feeling that, okay, they are male, so they are much more privileged in some ways. Do you feel that there's a lot of discrimination in kitchens? Mostly in Japan, in Bangkok, on um, other places, you don't see that kind of discrimination. Like what the, the kind of gender discrimination in kitchen you see in India, that kind of discrimination you don't see, uh, like say Italy, uh, in Japan or Bangkok, even China and uh, 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 Hong Kong, all these places. It's little more, uh, it's different. It's because there is a long history of women working in the kitchen, uh, in the professional kitchen. So there is that kind of discrimination is much less. Uh, okay. So I have a little different uh, experience because of all these things. And in my kitchen, I have a lot of uh, uh, female uh, uh, staff. Why are the world's best chefs still overwhelmingly male? You know, we talk about inclusion. I feel like it's giving everyone the equal opportunity to start at the same, you know, at the same starting point. Um, mm. And we're at a point now where perhaps it's gone a bit too far and we're not, uh, there aren't enough people questioning it and, mm. and actively making decisions to get it to where it needs to be, where it is actually equal. Um, mm. And so I think we are at a point where, where you know, when we're doing these kinds of talks and stuff, it's a lot of it's preaching to the choir. I think everyone's kind of on the same page, uh, but it's an opportunity for people to actively engage in giving other people, uh, perhaps people that have less opportunity, the opportunity to start at the same, at the same place. And then from which point it can become a meritocracy. And, you know, the hardest station at the restaurant is the pizza station because it's just crazy volume. And we have yeah. two badass ladies running it. And we started talking and we're like, you know, wow. okay, where, where's like some of the best pizza in the world? I mean, at least most people think it's in Naples. I may disagree, but a lot of people think it's in Naples. Well, if you look at Naples, there aren't a lot of pizzerias where the oven is, you know, is run by, by ladies. I think that we, I think we actually in, in active <laughs> pursuit of a pizzeria that, that had an oven run by ladies, it was like one, maybe, yeah. or it was like, the lady makes the pizza, but then it's still, the oven is still run by guys. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's, it, a lot of it is, is just about being conscious and choosing the kind of culture that you want to have. Chef Manu, Chef Anu. I don't think that uh, only uh, all the best chefs now are mostly men. That has changed over the last few years. Uh, say China, uh, like what, uh, like, because I have, work there uh, quite a bit so China like you get in so many good restaurants are run uh, by women and women chefs some of the best uh, noodle pullers uh, also uh, are the women like hardly people know because they, they are in small towns and it's not I'm talking about big cities I think some of the world's best chefs are probably women anyway uh, you know it's a uh, it's a no-brainer the most world's most celebrated chefs in terms of ratio may not be but really we're not to blame for that it's the fourth estate that's to be blamed for that who has its priorities wrong in being able to assess who's good and who isn't that who screams the loudest is not the best 
and I've been streaming that on top of from a top of mountain for years. But you know, it has very little impact. I mean, take India for example. I I do feel is I uh, of the many many hundreds of uh, women employees over the years that I've worked with and had, and they don't necessarily want to be part of this masochistic race. which is what trying to be a successful restaurant often becomes was there a certain point in your career where you started thinking about inclusivity and diversity in a very sort of like sharp sort of in a very focused way um and so my my turning point was really going you know gra- graduating i would say from from chef to restaurant tour and looking at everything from the top down and then as i'm putting this what would otherwise be kind of a you know bs uh employee handbook i mean how many how many corporate employee mm-hmm. handbooks have we all read and signed you know where then the actual workplace is the exact opposite of that and really asking myself is is this true is this real am i really going to do things to uh to make this reality or is it bullshit and then mm-hmm. you know once once you realize that, that that it is it is real then then every day is a constant constant effort because it does take probably a lot more effort to have a, a really wonderful place to work than it does to have a shitty place to work because yeah. everyone's going to be stressed everyone's going to come in and work long hours everyone's going to be you know hopped up on caffeine or other things and not eating a lot and be in a just a rotten mood generally so if you're not doing things to kind of mitigate that uh and to to actively ensure that people are working well together that you've hired the right people you know it's almost like being uh you know like a a coach of a of let's like, say a basketball uh basketball team cricket team like you want to hire not only for skill but for personality to make sure that people aren't butting heads you know so you're really doing everything actively 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 and in, and with full intention there was this time when you were at at the coach bnl and you had a you had a situation about uh the people who got the first portions of meat now we had about uh 18 people in benale um, and uh, so i realized after one we had a mixed team and whenever we were doing erachi chora or a biryani or any kind of chicken or beef kind of a dish like first boys used to go immediately and then for the women it was only rice so actually it was like a home situation you see in a very <laughs> solid work space that you know like and some of our um, some of the uh, ut staff were very old ladies and uh, they are they were very loving to all these boys also but they were very assertive and tell me that you know like there was no meat for us so then i had to make a rule that no now uh, women will eat first and uh, you guys will serve and then you will keep your for yourself also but you have to serve them so that is a, a very interesting incident what we see in actually people house that also comes in workspace i think that uh, the workplace diversity i was very conscious of from the beginning and whenever i could i have uh, worked my way out to make more uh, a workspace more diverse and you have to that should be in the structure of the a plan it cannot be that if you hire uh, two more women in your team that may, means that it will be more diverse it has yeah. to be structured in a certain way you're right diversity is not only about gender equality it's not about equal opportunity despite class and caste it's also about diversity in terms of like the kind of food that you represent on the menu yeah it's also that uh, you understand uh, polyculture in a certain way it's about understanding yeah. that will incorporate all other diversities in place you know you kind of already touched upon it does does bringing diversity into your kitchen not only in terms of which regions your you know your team comes from uh, but also what kind of cultures and what kind of uh, backgrounds does that does that lead to a more diverse menu not in term like i said not only in terms of regionality but also informed by the team's individual influences well but it's my most prized employees right now are the ones that come from the northeast a lot of assamese boys and girls i mean their palates are just mind blowing it, it could be the kitchen it could be service it could be the bar a they identify everything i mean i don't even have to try and do remember that 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 part of the country 
is is you know it, it owns nearly 75% or 78% of the biodiversity in the entire country it all belongs there so anything i bring to them oh i know this you know we eat this for breakfast and oh i know this yeah we put this in our porridge and i'm like oh my god this was a revelation for me and you already know it is like yeah 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 it all grows in our village but the ability to put flavors together is uncanny and and i think that is going to be where the next wave of serious talent is going to come from i just hope they have the platform i hope they have the exposure the education and if they don't they probably move to big towns and uh, get the platform that they need but i still think that there is there is a, that's still a creamy layer you know you need to still dig deeper and you will find that that some of the most insane talent as far as food is concerned is still not untapped it's still undiscovered so you know cheers to that chef anu do you see uh, you know your team informing your menu because of their backgrounds and not necessarily where they come from i always find uh, from, uh, this thing between language and cuisine they are very similar in nature like how dialect works it's how a different small smaller cuisine work to a major cuisine say if you are making them say uh, a japanese ingredient called myoga myoga you find in japan also and you find in manipur also so if you teach them how to deal with myoga they will pick it up better than anybody else who is seeing it for the first time or mm. say if you are showing somebody uh, say uh, a pepper which are which are grown only in nagaland in india those pepper called jhimjhim pepper if they you get it from nagaland and you show somebody that and a very similar pepper is sichuan pepper because they are from the same family then the character of that they understand much better than if you are teaching somebody for whom it's completely new thing yeah. so i think this this kind of thing at the most interesting thing you find gradually by working with people and diversity chef alex have you been surprised by somebody in your kitchen and what they brought in because they came from a completely different sort of like background a completely new set there was this one guy who he uh he laid jewels that's what he had done before he came to me he's from from uh from Rajasthan and like you want to talk about handwork and coordination and the ability to make like really fine things and knife cuts and all this i mean it blew me away and i asked him how long you've been cooking for and he said that this was his you know first cooking job so uh in terms of me learning uh from from them yes i mean a ton and also in just in terms of humility but um i think it's about creating an environment where you really give people a voice and you give them that security and knowing that their contribution no matter how big or small uh is going to have some impact even if it's maybe not in a dish you know where it doesn't translate to one thing on the menu like i put this on the menu but giving them one element and saying okay let's run with it like what do you think does it need more spice what you know what is your palate telling you um and kind of working with them as a team uh is definitely where you see more progress when it's just me coming up with stuff and putting it on the menu it feels very stagnant and when it's all of us just like kind of talking it out feeling it out together as a team uh we definitely see a lot more fluidity in the menu do you feel like when we come out of this we, we these will be all positive indications of a more inclusive dining culture do you feel like there are any micro trends that are coming out of this i think we have a tendency of overlooking the historical perspective and i studied history of course so i'm very passionate about that uh, as far as incredible foods are concerned and at some level i take great comfort in knowing that these microcosms will remain as they are because they will largely be protected there is so much that you know that that is amazing and if you go to the market maybe not every day but you know you will see that there is quite quite a bit of variety and there's a lot of interesting stuff um and unfortunately farmers aren't necessarily so inclined to grow them because uh they want you know they want a sure bet they want the things that most people are consuming um so i think that hopefully you know hope, hopefully along along with the appreciation of sort of the lesser known cuisines or the less lesser known uh traditional cuisines will also be the lesser known but equally delicious ingredients taking off from what he just said 30 years ago my parents had decided that they wanted to be farmers as well as the businessmen the business people that they were and we got this huge 
farm in Gurgaon, which was essentially farmland, right? Of course, not the megapolis it has become now. And uh, over 20 acres, uh, farmer affordable at that point, they decided to start growing vegetables. And of course, they had to do some crops to make the land viable. But my dad insisted on growing Brussels sprouts, broccoli, lettuces, because they were exporters, they would travel the world and therefore they were very inspired and enamored with all of this and they started going Swiss shard, right? By the end of the sixth month, the best fed cows in all of India were on our farm because everybody that we <laughs> sent the vegetables to rejected it. They said, who eats this garbage? What are these little gobies? What is this green gobi? Is there enough space uh, for queer folk in the kitchen, in the industry at large, how comfortable are we talking about caste discrimination? It's not about queer, uh, gender uh, and all that. I've seen that it's a macho space. So femininity, whether it's seen in a man or a woman, is always a problem. It's ab about femininity. It's not about uh, always about queerness or this thing. If um, a macho queer person will not be treated the same way as a feminine uh, queer person. The one thing that's nice about kitchens is that they, at least like in my sort of utopian idea of what a kitchen could be and what it should be, <laughs> is that it really is like the perfect meritocracy. You know, like if your mise en place is ready on time for service, then, you know, you'll get noticed and that could possibly lead to uh, either a promotion or just going on to the next hardest station and so forth and so on. Uh, likewise, if your mise en place is not ready and you go down, then, you know, you look like an ass. And I mean, obviously I'm oversimplifying it, but what we hope to do when we hire is we look for someone, we, we look for someone with particular experience, depending on whatever position needs to be filled um, and try as best as we can to just kind of ignore everything else and just evaluate that person. You know, is that person going to fit in on the station based on their experience? And then also, are they going to fit into the team in terms of, you know, do they get along with other people? Do they play nice with others? And do they embody the qualities that we look for in an individual, you know, according to how we sort of create envisioned, I guess, our, our, uh, our work culture. Um, and in doing so, you hopefully will get a diverse range of people into the kitchen. I mean, I guess that's maybe a little bit naive in some sense um, and possibly uh, again, a bit idealistic, but, you know, I, I really do hope that in looking at it purely from a merit-based standpoint that you will get to include, you know, all of these who are typically excluded from maybe more macho male-dominated kitchen. Thank you. That was, I wanted to end the discussion with a big, important and difficult question. And all the best with reopening all your respective spaces. <laughs> um, Thank you. I guess Thank I'll you. see you all guys soon. <laughs>